So as a psychologist, we have many different techniques that we can use. And certainly when we're dealing with patients, say with depression, we frequently use techniques like cognitive behavioral therapy. But what we're beginning to realize more and more is that many of these people with neuropsychiatric disorders and brain injury actually have cognitive problems. So what's being used by psychologists quite frequently now is what we call cognitive training. And that's a way that we can boost cognition and we don't use drugs to do this. We just do it through the method of getting people to exercise their brain using a, a, a fixed technique, usually on a computer, the cognitive training is delivered. But what we also found is that healthy people can benefit from this kind of cognitive training. So there's work by Torko Klingberg at the Karolinska Institute, where he showed that um, doing uh, cognitive training of working memory in healthy people over quite an extended period of time will actually lead to changes in activations in the brain, but will also lead to changes in D1 receptors in the brain. So this is really interesting, how you can actually modify uh, these circuits in the brain. And some years ago, with my colleague Martin Oral, we wrote a paper for the British Medical Journal called Use It or Lose It. And it was really all about the fact that we have to work areas of the brain if we want to keep them active. So in the way that people do crossword puzzles or Sudoku or other, other ways to sort of, or go on lifelong learning courses to really uh, stimulate their brain, this is a very important thing to do. And we really need to do this uh, lifelong. So we all we know that cognitive training works. So people like Till Weichs at the Institute of Psychiatry have actually done meta-analysis looking at the effects of cognitive training along with other forms of rehabilitation on patients with schizophrenia. And she's been able to show that this training has a moderate effect size on cognition, but also has a moderate effect size on psychosocial functioning. So by doing this, not only do the patients get the benefit of an improved cognition, but this has a knock-on effect on their functionality in every day in that their psychosocial functioning improves. So the trouble with cognitive training is that usually you have to come into a hospital setting to do this, and frequently you have to have specialized uh, staff to help you go through the programs and things like this. So this can be expensive and it can be inconvenient. In my laboratory, we thought, well, let's, how can we modify this cognitive training in order to make it fun, enjoyable, and easy to access? So what we decided to do was essentially what we call gamify the cognitive training. So in my lab, we got a uh, games developer to come and work with us, and we used the studies that we had over 20 years to look at the uh, neuropsychological benefits neuroimaging benefits of actually doing these tasks and the areas of the brain that they activated. And one of the tasks that we particularly were interested in was episodic memory. And that is the type of memory that we use every day. We know that episodic memory is related to functionality in schizophrenia and also in Alzheimer's disease. So we know that if we could boost uh, episodic memory, we would probably boost functional outcome. And so what we did was we used a, a wizard motif, a kind of, uh, everybody knows about Harry Potter and the, everybody's interested in it. And it seemed that that would be something really engaging for these patients, uh, people with schizophrenia, who we were trying to boost their memory for. So we worked with that kind of a theme. We utilized the data that we had showing how we could activate that area of the brain. We'd already done, published a paper in Neuropsychologia showing that it, when people were lying in a scanner, we, we looked at elderly people and people with mild cognitive impairment. When they were lying in a scanner doing a paired associate learning test, an episodic learning test, we got this nice activation in the hippocampal area. So we knew that was a way to stimulate and activate that area of the brain. So we essentially put that into a game, and then we actually went out and piloted it on people with schizophrenia to make sure that they found it interesting, enjoyable, they got it. And so this is a motivating way to improve uh, people's cognitive function. So it's essentially the cognitive training that psychologists accept as being very beneficial, but it's put into a game. 
And there are games companies now, where they call themselves sort of serious games companies, where they're trying to work to improve people's cognitive function through these means, and healthy people too. So it's a good thing for us to do, because everybody likes to play games, so we might as well play games that are good for us. But of course, not all games are good for us. Um, these games that we, I'm talking about have been developed with an evidence base behind them. So it's very important that there is evidence, scientific evidence, showing that these games actually work and are successful. So in this game, the way that we decided to do it was it's, it's very much based on a, a kind of episodic memory theme. So you, you can uh, fight with wizards and things like that. But basically what you have to do, what the hippocampus in the brain does is remember the location of objects in space. So this game is very much based on that. And what happens is you, as you remember things, you get rewarded with spells that you can then fight against other wizards with. And so it's a very engaging type of thing. And the nice thing is the game is adjusted in, in, to help with your motivation so that if you're doing well, it pushes you on and you get more challenge for the game and you, you, you can gain more things and then cast more spells and fight other wizards and move along the trajectory. If you're having difficulty, it brings you back down again. So it's nicely tri titrated in the way that, you know, games, games people do to make sure that you're learning and remembering as much as you can. And it keeps giving you more and more levels of difficulty. And you keep encountering different situations with wizards who are trying to attack you and you're trying to attack them and you spells. And then you, uh, you know, are successful and you get lots of rewards for doing that. So what we found was that if we ask uh, schizophrenic patients to train on this um, test for eight hours over one month, not only does their episodic memory improve, but we also got uh, improvements in their activities of daily living. So the, when we looked at their global uh, functioning through the GAF test, we found that they also improved on that. So it wasn't just limited to their episodic memory. They also got improvements in their psychosocial functioning with the test. So when we asked uh, people with schizophrenia to play the game for eight hours over one month, we found that not only did they get gains in their episodic memory, so their memory did improve, but we also found that their psychosocial functioning improved. So the game really had benefits that weren't just restricted to the memory, but also to their psychosocial functioning in everyday activities. So what we find is that obviously nowadays people are so interested in their physical health and they monitor their physical health. Frequently they have Fitbits to measure their steps or their, their running or whatever and in, in their phones they measure their sleep or their steps or whatever. So people are very keen to measure their physical health. But what we're finding is that unfortunately as yet we're not using this new technology enough to improve our cognition, our, our brain health. So it, it will be good when we have more apps on phones where people can monitor their cognition and if they notice a change in it, they can start to improve it and that will be very beneficial. And they can also use games on apps, on phones or iPads to uh, improve their cognitive function and hopefully their mental well-being as well. People are going to play games, so they should play games that are good for their uh, brain health and also that are motivating, maybe improve their positive outlook on life because we can adjust the way that we see the world. That's what cognitive behavioral treatments are all about. But you need to use games where there is an evidence base to them because some games uh, really adjust, don't really have the same effects. There's no neuropsychological or neuroimaging evidence to show that they are having the effects on behavior and on, on perhaps on the brain. These games that are based on uh, a long history of data do have. So one way that we can use games is both for people with neuropsychiatric disorders and brain injury. So for instance, if we're currently working with people with mild cognitive impairment, this is the early stage of Alzheimer's disease. And we're working with a specific group which is called amnestic mild cognitive impairment. And the uh, progression to Alzheimer's disease is now recognized. So the point is that if you can activate those areas of the brain that are first affected in Alzheimer's disease, such as the hippocampal formation, 
you may find that you can keep those areas functioning better for longer and it will delay the onset or the worst outcomes of some of these disorders. We also know that in healthy people, there is a deterioration in your cognition over time. So we function at our highest level in our 20s and then, then there's a slight decline. And of course, as healthy people, we have lots of um, ways that we can uh, use strategies and it's called you know, experience to use strategies to overcome some of our, you know, perhaps we're uh, don't, our memory's not quite as good as it used to be. But there may be these, these games may be a great way to actually activate these areas of the brain. And not just in the area of memory, but we can also think about attention because attention is so important. Frequently we need sustained attention to do really well, you know, concentration to do really well on a task because it requires that we have to focus on that and get the, the most out of it. But now we find that lots of people, because we multitask and because we're uh, looking at our phones, looking at our computers, people are ringing us up and different things are happening that we find it hard to maintain our focus of attention or concentration for long periods of time, which may be necessary for certain jobs. And the benefits to, to this may also be for other groups. So we can think of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, where there are problems in, in sustained attention and concentration. They, they have trouble sticking and focusing on one thing. Uh, and for this reason, they're frequently giving medications when they're in the um, more moderate to severe end of the spectrum. So for mild ADHD, you can just treat this with psychological treatments such as CBT or more directed um, psychological treatments for ADHD. But when it gets to be more moderate and severe, frequently drug treatments are used like methylphenidate Ritalin, which affects dopamine and noradrenaline in the brain. But we may be able to, especially in children, it would be nice if we could reduce the need for these drugs or maybe reduce the dose that people have and the, the um, frequency which, which, with which they're dosed if we could also um, cognitively train them to be able to focus their attention and, and perform better. So it may be that sometimes we will have combination of treatments which may be the most effective to get the best outcomes for people with ADHD and other disorders.